Good afternoon, and welcome to the final round of the inaugural CSU Grad Slam. My name is Mark DeLarco, and I am the Dean of the College of Graduate Studies at San Jose State University. We hope you were able to enjoy the presentations in the pre preliminary round rooms. If not, we are delighted to present the top three uh, scoring students from each preliminary round room here as our nine finalists advancing to this round of the competition. Before the students present their work, we are fortunate to have Dr. Mary Papazian, the president of San Jose State University, share some words with us. Please join me in welcoming President Papazian. Thank you, Mark. And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Grad Slam. As the only college of graduate studies in the CSU system, we are delighted to be hosting this year's virtual competition. I especially would like to welcome all of our student participants here with us today, as well as their family and friends. We are so glad to have you here. It feels like we finally have turned the corner on the pandemic, so hopefully we can welcome you onto our campus one day in person. I also want to welcome all of our colleagues and campus representatives from throughout the Cal State system, as well as the Friends of California Higher Education who are here today. It is wonderful that you could join us. And last, but certainly not least, I'm delighted to welcome our three judges. Suzanne Ortega is the president of the Council of Graduate Schools, a group to which I was honored to speak back in 2019 at the Council Summer Workshop in San Diego. Thank you for being with us, Suzanne. Our second judge is Patricia Seguenza, who serves as Vice President of Bioanalytical Sciences at Genentech. I know that our own graduate dean, Mark DeLarco, earned his PhD in organic chemistry. So I suspect the two of you can speak the same language and have had some interesting conversations. Welcome, Patricia. And finally, welcome to our third judge, Tammy Vasha Haas, the Dean of the Graduate College at Boise State University and past president of the Western Association of Graduate Schools. We are just thrilled, Tammy, to have you and our other two judges here with us. And we really appreciate your participation in this inaugural event for the California State University system. Now, there are a lot of things I love about Grad Slam, and chief among them is that it serves as a fun and creative platform to highlight the extraordinary work of all of our talented graduate students. As we all know, the CSU does a great job providing access to graduate education, supporting our graduate students and helping to propel them to the highest level of expertise in their chosen discipline through research, scholarship, and creative activities. Here at San Jose State, we are very proud of our growing reputation as Silicon Valley's public graduate school, a place where graduate students can come and flourish. I am sure all of you here today also take pride in the graduate programs and impact at your universities. In fact, I know that the recognition of the importance of graduate education is something I share with my colleagues at the other CSU campuses. We are all working to back that commitment up with real investments and resources that better support both research and graduate education, since we know they often go hand in hand. I hope that the CSU will continue to prioritize and support its campuses, research and graduate education efforts, knowing that they often intersect and build off one another. Now, I suspect that everyone in attendance today knows and appreciates the value of graduate education. You probably have read about the enhanced salary potential, the specialized knowledge you will gain in your field of study, and other tangible benefits of an advanced degree. But graduate education over the decades has not been perfect. A relatively new book by the scholars Leonard Casuto and Robert Weisbach entitled The New PhD, How to Build a Better Graduate Education, examines how the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to light a number of issues in graduate education that they argue must have been present for decades. And although they assert that graduate studies needs to be more student-centered, more career diverse, and more public facing, they optimistically note that the current crisis may actually help accelerate solutions to many of the problems that they say have persisted for years. They argue that a more humane and socially dynamic graduate experience is possible 
and that this experience can and should be reconceived as a public good where graduate students become change agents for a better, more prosperous, and more equitable world. This approach certainly aligns with what we are doing here at San Jose State, and I know it resonates throughout the CSU system as well. The bottom line is, I believe that we can all feel good about the long range forecast for graduate education, and nowhere is that better represented than in the amazing work of our students. And we're here to hear from them today. So let me just close by saying how absolutely delighted I am to be with you today to help share in the excitement of Grad Slam and to help honor these impressive researchers and their projects. Thank you all so very much for being here and enjoy the event. Back to you, Mark. Thank you, President Papazian. <clears throat> I'd like to now introduce our honored MCs for this final round. First is Dr. Ganesh Raman. Dr. Raman is the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Research for the California State University System. Welcome, Ganesh. Thank you, Mark, for your introduction. I'm really happy to join you in celebrating outstanding research and creativity across the CSU this afternoon. This morning was such a treat. Thank you, Ganesh. Our second MC this afternoon is Dr. Elaine Fry. Dr. Fry is the Assistant Vice President of Graduate Studies at CSU Fullerton. Welcome, Elaine. Thank you, Mark. I'm so excited to be part of this inaugural event. Uh, please give these nine finalists a round of applause. Each competitor here this afternoon first emerged as a representative of their campus and then earned a place here in the finals by being a top finisher in this morning's preliminary competition. It was no easy feat to get to this stage of the competition and we congratulate all of you for your work and dedication to your field. Congratulations again, and we look forward to your presentations this afternoon. Now we would like to take time to review the guidelines and rules of this afternoon's session. Each of our participation, participants today has been allowed to use only one slide to complete their presentation. During their com competition, the participants will be judged based on their ability to successfully engage in a non-specialist audience while communicating key details about their research in three minutes or less. The judging criteria for today are available in your event guide that's posted in the chat. Because this event is being held virtually, we will allow students to present for three minutes with a five second grace period without penalty. Thereafter, a point will be deducted from the student's total score every five seconds of time that the student goes over. It's a daunting task. Despite being an online event, each competitor will be presenting live, not through a recording. So you're in for a treat this afternoon, get ready. I also have a couple of housekeeping notes I'd like to share with you. We know you would all like to cheer on your participants and the chat is open for that purpose. Please be respectful to all our participants. The way we will proceed for each student today is that Ganesh will introduce the student who will then deliver their presentation. Afterwards, while the judges tally their scores, I will chat with the students to learn a little bit more about them. Please note that this chat will have absolutely no influence on the scoring. After all students have presented, the judges will submit their scores and the winners will be announced. We will have the fir a first place, a second place winner um, based on the judges score, but we will also have an audience choice award based on your votes. Information will follow on how to participate in the audience choice selection after the students present. Okay, I'm sure that our students are ready and you are anxious to see them. So let's begin. Nicole Roberts, would you please turn on your camera and microphone and say hello? Hello. Great, we can hear you. Are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. Perfect, here we go. I bet you think bats are just for Halloween. Nope. What about vampire bats? Are they gonna come and eat you in your sleep? No, there are only three of those out of 1400 bat species on earth. And look how cute this bat is eating an apple. 
Microbats can also eat 100% of their body weight in insects every night, saving billions in pest control. And nectar-eating bats pollinate some of the most important foods like cocoa. Yeah, bats are important and not just for chocolate reasons. So here's the thing. Bats are declining. Like all mammals, they can't live in too hot or too cold areas, so they must find an environment that meets their needs. But this is getting harder and harder. Raising the land for agriculture is still the number one threat to bats, but there is one more serious threat, climate change. By 2100, it's estimated that the Earth will suffer up to 50% biodiversity losses from climate change alone. So to save future bats from extinction, is there a way to figure out where they will be ahead of time? There is. I collected geographic information for 23 of the most at-risk bats and represented them as ranges like you see here. This is for one bat in my study. Then I gathered environmental data for the current and simulated climate in 2050 and plugged them into a program that predicts where bats will be based on where they live now. Using that program, I generated current and future range maps. The map on the left is for the current climate and the one on the right is for the simulated one in 2050. And the, these red regions here are high likelihood areas for bat occurrences that appear to be lost in 2050. Finally, I measured the amount of overlap between current and future ranges. I had some questions. First, how do my ranges compare with those produced by experts at the International Union for Conservation of Nature, or IUCN for short, a global organization that measures which species are most at risk around the world? Second, which environmental variables were most important in figuring out where bats will be in 2050? Finally, how much habitat was lost in 2050 from climate change? What did I find? My ranges and those of the IUCN only overlapped 50% of the time, indicating that our expert knowledge might need to be updated. Secondly, distance to water was the most important variable, predicting bat ranges 40% of the time on average. Lastly, and most importantly, bats will lose 27% of their collective habitat from climate change alone in 2050. That's a really scary thought. So what's the take home here? Bats are clearly at risk for extinction due to climate change. And these modeling programs work really well, but they can work even better if we have better data on bats. And as it is, bats are still demonized around the world, which makes it really, really hard to collect data on them. So what can we do? Change our attitude towards bats. Use this program more widely. And above all, don't just think about them during Halloween, but all year round as fellow mammals who need food, water, and a cozy place to rest. That's not so scary after all. Thanks. Thank you, Nicole. That was so interesting. Thanks. I love the focus on bats. Honestly, I think they're adorable. So I don't see the um, <laughs> I don't see why people are so adverse to them. Um, could you just tell us why how you became interested in this line of study? Yeah, I can. Um, I really love looking at maps as a kid and geography. So I decided, well, let me choose a cool animal to to use this um, research, uh, the, these niche models as they're called. And bats are the only flying mammal. So I said, hey, let's look at bats. And I found out they were pretty at risk and they're, they're endangered. So I thought, let me, let me go ahead with this. And I'm really glad I did. Yeah, I think it's really important work. I mean, it's interesting because you, you mentioned climate change and, and farming as two things that are the main threats. So mm -hmm. I mean, the policy implications are pretty huge here. Um, yeah. What do you think is the biggest way that we can protect policymakers could protect bats and their populations? Right. There, there appears to be a gap in communication not, and not just, there's a huge gap in data uh, because there aren't enough surveys to support the bat research that we need to show policymakers that bats are an important part of our ecosystem. So I guess first and foremost, there needs to be better communication about how to get data about bats. And then the scientific research will uh, speak for itself. Yeah, that sounds like a good plan. Um, have you ever um, been around bats in real life or is it just you study from I've afar? I've seen them around. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would love to study them more. I'd love to see them. And in fact, we have family in Austin, Texas, where there, there's a big uh, bat lover population. So it'd be great to go and see them sometime like for real. Um, although I should say, you're, you know, spelunking in caves is very much um, prohibited. Uh, when you see a bat, please leave it alone and call your local wildlife refuge center. That's 
Great advice. Yeah, thanks for the reminder on that. Um, could you remind us what um, what your program and, and campus um, is, and then you know add on to that. What do you like most about your program? Absolutely. So my um, program is the biology department at Cal State uh, Dominguez Hills. And what I like most about it is that they've come to embrace non-traditional students. So I, I had a, several careers before becoming a grad student and I'm delighted that uh, they saw my diverse background and the fact that I love science and got a degree in science. Um, and after several years, I wanted to pursue a graduate education. So I have to say that was a big warm hug from the graduate department. And I really sincerely thank them for letting me in and letting me become part of the family. That sounds like a really good community. Do you, um, are you close with your cohort um, in your program? We are, uh, they now, well, we've embraced the virtual connectivity of it all. So we have a Slack channel where we communicate and I have a really good friend of mine that I met in the grad department. Uh, she lives not too far from me actually. So we, we have socially distant dinners and, um, I, and I'd love to, you know, through through more graduate experiences, this is an, this is a tremendous experience to be able to be with the other graduate students. So, um, I'd like to build more relationships. So, hopefully, you know, when we have a handle on the pandemic, we can come together for more celebrations. I love the DH parties; they're the best. <laughs> That sounds great. Well, Nicole, it looks like the judges are ready now. So I really appreciate yeah. you sitting down with me at our couch here. And um, okay. <laughs> well, we're ready for the next competitor. Thank you. Ms. Bachadri, would you please turn on your camera and microphone and say hello? Hello and good afternoon. Great. We can hear you. Are you ready to go? Yes, sir. I am. Perfect. Here we go. The United States is one of the largest kale producing countries around the world, with California accounting for over 85% of that production. And within California, Kern County accounts for over 60% of that production, which makes our agricultural sector significant around the nation. However, with such a great production comes a downfall for both our farmers and growers in the form of diseases that carrots can be affected with. Now, these diseases not only reduce the quality of the carrots, but also their yield and as well as their marketability because they're simply rejected in the fresh market. Now, out of all of these common diseases, my project mainly focused on a disease called cavity spot of carrots. And um, this disease is of a huge concern, especially here in California, because it affects over 50% of the overall acreage. The disease is caused by a fungal-like microorganism called Pythium violae which basically infects carrot roots, causing for these small sunken brown to black lesions to form on the carrots, as can be seen in the image on the top left. Now, the disease is indeed difficult to manage, and currently there is a use of chemical fungicides, uh, which over the time are becoming unreliable, mainly due to the fact that these pathogens are becoming resistant to this fungicide. And generally speaking, as we all know, chemical fungicides are harmful for our environment. So with that, there is a search for rather a more natural method in a form of a biological, um, biological organism that can be used to control this disease and therefore reduce the need for chemical fungicides. And that's where my project comes in, through which I have been exploring um, local species of a bacterium called Streptomyces, which are also found in the soil environment and are known to produce these organic or natural compounds that show antifungal activity, which means they can be used as biological agents to control these pathogens and against these diseases. Well, with the promising results of my project, I have been able to select and identify four different streptomyces species that can strongly inhibit the growth of this carrot pathogen. And as you can see an example at the bottom right image, one of these um, strains is showing the inhibitory effect against that pathogen. Therefore, controlling or could be used as a biological control to control this disease. So with these results, I will be putting forward these four streptomyces species as new promising biological agents 
um, against these pathogens and therefore initiating the formulation of a biofungicide that can be used as a safe alternative um, to control these diseases and therefore save our crops as well as our environment. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Ba. That was great. There's the timer. <laughs> um, so, you know, when you started talking about um, that these issues, I started getting up concerned that um, maybe I would get a diseased carrot. Are the people that are buying carrots from the grocery store, are they at any risk? Well, um, humans are not at a risk. So um, you will not get anything from this disease. It's just that uh, markets are not, you know, buying these carrots because they show these um, lesions on them in the case of cavity spot, but there are also other, um, you know, diseases that infect carrots overall, but overall they're not harmful for humans. So there's no worry. It's just that we're, you know, our agriculture sector is just losing money because they just simply get rejected by the fresh market. And is this similar to other, um, other produce markets or is this very, very particular to carrots? Um, this particular disease, you mean cavity spot? Yes, mm -hmm. spot, um, through this pathogen, Pethium viole is particular to this, um, you know, to this crop, in, the, in this case, carrots. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, I, I, I'm an economist by training, so I'm thinking this is probably the, the end result is that the consumer is going to be paying a higher amount of money because of this, right? So it's in everybody's best interest to get um, this, in, this solved. Exactly. Yeah, great job. Um, could you remind us what your um, campus and your program are? So I am from the biology department. I'm doing my master's, of course, and um, will be completing very soon, graduating this semester. And I am from um, CSU, Bakersfield. Great. Now, there's a lot of graduate programs to choose from, particularly in your field. Um, what made you choose the one that you did? So um, I've always been, of course, interested in biology, but within biology, my interest has always been in microbiology and molecular. So um, luckily, when I entered my master's program, um, I had the opportunity to meet my mentor, Dr. Isolde Francis, and um, she runs a plant pathology lab you know, at our campus and is also a professor, of course. So we sat down, we talked about different uh, projects, and it just happens to be that she does a lot of microbiology and molecular biology work in her lab, works with microbes, which I wanted to do. So we, you know, it just clicked right away for both of us. And then we came across talking about carrots, and, you know, we have a great production here in Kern County. And then we just got into talking about different diseases. And that's how I ended up, you know, picking this project and working on it. And, and your lab, do you collaborate together or are you mostly working individually? Um, well, um, in our lab, we definitely collaborate with one another, like all the lab members in the lab, but we do have other uh, professors that are running, you know, microbiology labs. You know, there's a professor who was also on my committee, my committee member. So we also collaborate with them. We gain, you know, um, expertise from one another. She is um, an expert in microbiology. So I've gained so much help from her for my project. So definitely we have collaboration um, among the department. That's great. Well, thank you so much for talking with us. It sounds like the judges are ready um, to proceed and we're ready for our next um, competitor, but thank you so much. Thank you. Lupe Franco, would you please turn on your camera and microphone and say hello? Yes, hi, hello. Great, we can hear you. Are you ready to go? I am. Perfect, here we go. This is Greg Tarolo, a Sacramento local who had recently become unhoused in 2020, just when the harsh winter weather had set in on the city. He was interviewed about warming centers and the city's strict requirements for opening them. In this interview, Greg stated that he did not know warming centers even existed as the city had not opened one in four years. Three days later, he was found unresponsive on a 37 degree morning, wrapped in cold blankets that were soaked from the previous night's rain. This is the reality for over 150,000 Californians who are experiencing houselessness, of which 68% are considered unsheltered. This danger is only going to increase 
As climate change brings California more frequent and intense weather events, such as heat waves and floodings. For my thesis, I wanted to know, as California prepares for the predicted impacts of climate change, are jurisdictions considering unhoused populations when developing their climate strategies? To figure this out, I analyzed 15 climate action plans from cities and counties in California with the largest unhoused populations. These plans serve as roadmaps to the activities that jurisdictions need to take in order to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, which is known to contribute to climate change. What I found was sad, but not surprising. I found that no jurisdictions explicitly stated that they met with unhoused populations before developing their climate action plans. And so why is that? Well, this is what researchers call the power of representation dilemma, which means that as outsiders, planners can only make assumptions of what the community faces, which leads to the development of strategies that do not accurately reflect what the local needs are. With this analysis, I created a list of recommendations to help planners connect with their communities, such as requiring planners to have on the ground training with local organizations in their jurisdictions so that they can learn about important street level issues. With these findings and recommendations, my research can spark the initial conversation about creating equitable and just strategies that give unhoused individuals a voice and access to critical resources. This is what Greg Tarola deserved. Thank you. Thank you, Lupe. That was so great. You know, I think that this issue um, of you know, affordable housing is one of California's biggest problems. And, you know, I think this is a huge, um, you're taking on a huge issue here and I applaud you for that. I, I wonder what inspired you to take on this particular topic and this particular work? Yeah, so I really uh, looked to my community and I saw what were some of the issues that were affecting my community. So I'm originally from Los Angeles and here we have the largest unhoused population in the entire state. And this is well over 40,000 people who are unhoused and they're vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And so with this reality, I saw that there wasn't enough efforts to try to give these individuals resources to protect themselves from climate change the way the rest of us have the opportunity to have those resources. And so seeing this injustice really, uh, really made me interested in further analyzing what cities and counties are doing and kind of determining like, why aren't they doing that? And what are some of the barriers preventing them from protecting them? Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I was really interested in this topic um, and why I wanted to further research it in my graduate program. Uh, thank you. And, and I know that one of your recommendations was to go into the communities themselves. And, you know, how do you, that, that sounds like a great idea, but how do you implement that? Like, what do you do? How do you start that initiative? Yeah, so planners actually already go to their communities and they talk with local organizations. But the thing is that they uh, get the information from these organizations, take it back to their offices and then create these plans. Whereas instead, I believe that they should go out to these organizations and actually spend time with them, but also learn from the communities and learn about what's their, what they're missing in their own efforts and their own methods. Because I noticed that unhoused populations specifically were not invited to these meetings that they were having. They did not have a voice. And so there's obviously a gap there that I think that we should um, try to fill. And so this was one of the recommendations that I believe would get them to, you know, to do that. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing your uh, your work here. Um, it looks like our judges are ready to proceed. So I'd like to thank you. And now we're um, ready for the next presenter.
Okay, Michael Brodheim, would you please turn on your camera and microphone and say hello? Great. Hello. <laughs> Uh, we can hear you. Are you ready to go? I am. Just a heads up. There is a, I'm babysitting a dog, so you may hear some barking. Hopefully not. Okay, here we go. Imagine always being judged by the worst decision of your life. That's the fate of some 30,000 life prisoners in the California prison system. After serving some fixed period of time, typically 15 or 25 years, these lifers must convince a panel of parole commissioners that they no longer pose a threat to society. Until they can make that case, they will remain locked up. Why am I interested in this? Because I was one of those lifers. For over 34 years of my life, from the age of 22 until the moment I was released on July 23rd, 2015, Everything I did was monitored, supervised, documented, and scrutinized. I'm not complaining. Actually, I'm just grateful to be free. Still, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that depriving a person of their freedom is an extreme sanction. And it behooves all of us to ensure that those who act in our names do so fairly and reasonably, not arbitrarily. Today, although not when I was in prison, California recognizes that youthful minds are still developing and that therefore those who commit offenses when they are still young are less culpable than those who commit their offenses when they are older. Although the line distinguishing youthful from adult offenders is somewhat arbitrary, California today follows the science in drawing the line between the two at age 26. People who commit their offenses before that age are entitled to parole hearings at which, by law, great weight must be given to what are known as the hallmark features of youth, as well as to subsequent evidence of growth, maturity, and rehabilitation. I examined data from California's parole board to see if being classified as a youth offender had the impact on parole outcomes that the legislature intended. I found that indeed it did, at least in one important respect. In fiscal year 2018 to 2019, youth offenders were 5% more likely to be found suitable for parole than their counterparts who committed their offenses later in life. This was st statistically significant at the 1% level. By contrast, however, when they were found not suitable for parole, youth offenders were 8% less likely than their older, older counterparts to receive the minimum deferral between parole hearings that the law allows. This was also statistically significant at the 1% level. Evidently, whatever compassion and understanding the parole panel is able to extend to a youth offender with respect to parole suitability, they are not able to extend that same level of compassion and understanding with respect to the deferral period between parole hearings. I also looked at the parole data to see what effect, if any, gender had on parole outcomes. I found that female offenders were more likely than their male counterparts to be found suitable for parole. I also found that female parole commissioners were significantly more likely than their male counterparts to grant parole. This latter finding is a completely new contribution to the parole literature and it needs to be further explored. It suggests that higher parole grant rates, a policy outcome that future governors may or may not embrace, can be achieved simply by appointing more female commissioners. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Great work. And I really appreciate how you included your experience in um, what you have done. You know, I'm wondering, a lot of what you were saying is that the composition of um, who's in charge is basically affecting um, who's not in charge. I wonder if you could talk more about how we can um, diversify um, who is making these decisions or what, what would be your biggest takeaway, um, your policy recommendation to, to help improve this? Well, my original project was intended to be about the impact of race on parole outcomes. Um, and I submitted a Public Records Act request to the Department of Corrections and they denied that request. Um, they instead gave me the gender information and the information about the, the age of the offenders um, um, at the time of the offense. Um, and so that's the report I did. Uh, if, if they, you know, this, if they give you lemons, you have to make lemonade, N not that these are lemons. But I, I've not lost sight of what I really want to do. And so I, I filed a lawsuit and the court ruled in my favor and I got the racial breakdown of the people uh, appearing before the board. And uh, it turns out, um, I was a little bit surprised, but maybe I, I shouldn't be, that there is um, a tremendous uh, racial impact, 
particularly if you're African American. Um, and this is um, consistent with another finding that was uh, done uh, on California's parole um, board um, five years earlier than the data I considered. Um, so that's my next project. And the recommendation I would give is that the parole board look at this information. They not only oppose, oppose giving, giving me the information about the racial uh, impact, um, they, they, don't want, they don't want to see it or hear it. So the policy recommendation is both with respect to, I mean, I, I presented information to you about gender impact uh, and the impact of age. The, the impact on age was something the legislature designed. The impact of, from, about gender is largely unknown. Um, that needs to be explored to see if, what, the, what the parole board thinks about that. But they need to get their head out of the sand also, and, and the legislature needs to tell them to get their head out of the sand to look at the, at the racial impact of, uh, of these, what, the, what is the racial impact of these decisions, um, whether it's implicit bias or explicit bias, they need to take a look at it. It doesn't look good is the, the kindest thing I can say about it, particularly since we're in this, this obvious period of reckoning. Uh, the legislature um, needs to um, f f force the parole board to do these things because they're not willing to do it on their own. Would you think that um, transparency of both um, both the the information about parolees and and about you know who's making a decision would make this um, improve this? Do you think they should provide more data to the public? Yes, they should. But um, so these kinds of performance, they're, they're called performance measures. They serve two purposes. One is internal and one is external. So yes, for transparency, they should make it available to the public. They used to, they stopped doing it. Um, I think, I'm not sure about that. Um, and I mean, I remember when I was in prison, I used to be able to get a lot more uh, data from them and they, they've stopped producing that data. So that's external, but for in internal, as I was, I was suggesting earlier, they need to monitor what's going on. So for whatever reason, uh, if, which happens to be the case, uh, African-Americans are substantially less likely to be found suitable, suitable for parole. And the previous study that I alluded to, um, not the one that I did, was able to control for all sorts of things like whether there was a private attorney, the level of education, uh, the level of programming, it didn't matter. Uh, African Americans simply were being found uh, not being found suitable, nearly at the same rate as any other racial group. Um, so yes, it needs to be made available. Uh, they need to, the board needs to keep track of these things both for external transparency reasons and for internal reasons, so that they know about it and they can take appropriate steps um, to fix it. Um, but these are the same problems exist in other areas of our, our society as well, as we all know, for example, in policing. Yes, thank you. Now, thank you so much for presenting your important work. And um, it looks like the judges are now ready to, um, to move on to the next presenter. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Emma Bianco, would you please turn on your camera and microphone and say hello? Uh, hello, hear me okay? Okay. It's great. We can hear you. Are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Perfect. Here we go. Even if I did not study the right wing in the United States, I, along with many others, are questioning how has white supremacy and white nationalism become entrenched in mainstream American culture, even in 2021? And in answering this question, I stumbled across a lesser known field of scholarship, the role of women in white supremacist groups. And looking to examine this phenomenon in my community, I narrowed down my research to analyze the Orange County chapter of the United Daughters of Confederacy Women's Organization. I asked myself, how did these neo-Confederate women embody white supremacist beliefs? And to what extent did they ingratiate these ideologies into Orange County? Finding information on the Orange County chapter of the UDC, also known as the Emma Sampson chapter, was extremely difficult for this small group of about 50 women has not been referenced in any other literature. 
However, with the chapter's archives at Cal State Fullerton, I discovered that from 1908 to the 1990s, the Emma Sampson chapter, beyond trying to preserve pure Southern bloodlines, disseminated a revisionist history of the Civil War, which glorified the antebellum South, devoid of any mention of institutional slavery or racial violence. They primarily hosted lecture series and encouraged young students to win scholarships by writing essays that concerned the Confederacy's moral superiority. But although these women's programs preached thinly veiled white supremacist philosophies, like creating a white dominated environment and silencing the history of minority groups, the UDC was paraded as an exemplar of community volunteerism. Counterintuitively, these women gained prominence and praise by emphasizing their feminine inferiority and reverence for so-called American patriotism. And with trust from residents, they could cunningly introduce their white supremacist discourse into Southern California unquestioned. But why should we care about the history of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, a seemingly inconsequential group which did not certainly reinvent Orange County's civic life? Unlike flagrantly open white supremacist groups like the Proud Boys or QAnon, this story tells us how white supremacist mindsets are gradually cultivated in our communities, unbeknownst to us. And to understand that process, we need to examine the usually overlooked contributions of women. Lastly, as many other scholars of this field have stated, we must remember that to eliminate white supremacist ideologies, we must first understand how they have become endemic in our daily lives, even in the subtlest of ways. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. So I have had the distinct pleasure of seeing your presentation three yeah. times. Um, Emma, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to see you again. <laughs> so thank you for that again. And um, you know, I, I really love this topic because I think that you know you said in your presentation, why should you care? But I mean, to me, it's obvious that history is so important in informing our decisions because you know history repeats itself. So I'm just wondering if you can talk about um, you know what lessons could we learn about. Um, anti-racism that have happened in the past that we can apply to our current situation and, you know, what you're, from your perspective. Hmm. I think, I don't know if there's like one lesson. I think it's, I feel that we should pay attention more um, to white supremacist groups and white nationalist groups. Because, well, what happened is like, I had been interested in right-wing groups and then, you know, January 6 happened. And what was really interesting was when they were interviewing the insurrectionist, what they were saying um, and what they believe, I was like, oh my gosh, I just read five books like that repeat what they say. Like this, it wasn't, I think a lot of people were like, how did this happen? It's like, if we had been paying attention to history and what these groups believe, it's not really a surprise. Like this isn't something new and maybe, you know, social media has made it that these groups are able to be more open, but really it's not something that was completely revolutionary. And I, I think a lesson, I guess, to take away is I think it bothers me when news media or other people, you know, look at January 6th and they go, oh, they're just crazy people. And like, you can believe that, but I think that discounts understanding their rationale. And if you don't understand their rationale and the logic behind what they think, then you're never going to be able to, you know, undo it or get to those people and really try to, you know, systemically dissolve white supremacy in America if you just you know, label those people as, oh, well, they're all just racist. It's like, well, that might be true, but there's there's a lot more beneath. There's a lot of layers to it. So that's my lesson, I guess. Yeah, I really liked what you said, too, about, you know, paying more attention. And I think that, you know, I'm wondering if you, you, you have a thoughts about how, how can we get those historical, um, you know, contexts out there so that people will pay attention? So I think, I always think uh, like CNN should have more historians on, but that's just me. Um, but I think a part of it is the duty of the historian as well. I think a lot of times history books, you know, maybe they're published, but a lot of it is for academics. There's not for the common person at Barnes and Noble, so it's not really accessible. So I think it's the job of historians to write books that yes, are academic, but also meant for the general readership. So it's interesting to read. Um, so that might include, you know, changing your style a little bit. And I think there's actually not a lot of books written about white supremacy after maybe the 90s. 
Um, and obviously a lot's happened since then. So I think there just needs to be more research by other people in the field as well, just to kind of get the word out there. Yeah, thank you. Well, it looks like our judges are ready to move on to the next presenter. So thank you so much, Emma. Thank you. Okay, Nick Matthews, would you please turn on your camera and microphone and say hello? Hello there, can you hear me? Great, we can hear you. Are you ready to go? I'm ready. Perfect, here we go. Many of my public speaking students who meet me for the first time are surprised to learn that I am deaf. Growing up in elementary school, I remember my teachers would wear these big bulky FM microphone systems. And while they allowed me to hear them pretty well, they didn't address a key barrier to my learning. Many of the videos were not closed captioned. In effect, they were not accessible. The California Community College's Transfer's Office defines accessibility as a standard which ensures students with disabilities can use and access their instructional materials as easily as students without disabilities. Unfortunately, we know from a litany of lawsuits filed by groups like the National Federation of the Blind that countless American college students with disabilities continue to confront the problem of inaccessible instructional materials. In my dissertation research, I sought to address this problem area by investigating two key research questions. First, how do we measure disabled student perceptions of accessibility? And second, is there a relationship between perceived accessibility and perceived learning in a course? To investigate these questions, I deployed a survey methodology, surveying 116 students with disabilities. In the first part of my study, I developed an instrument to measure disabled student perceptions of accessibility, drawing on the four accessibility principles of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Perceivable materials are compatible with students' preferred senses, such as hearing and sight. Operable materials are easy to work and easy to navigate. Understandable materials are simple, intuitive, and work in predictable ways. Finally, robust materials are compatible with students' assistive technologies. Using a technique called factor analysis, I was able to validate a 33-item scale measuring disabled students' perceptions of accessibility. With this scale in hand, I then proceeded to the second part of my study, in which I investigated the relationship between perceptions of accessibility in a course and their perceptions of learning. I used a technique called regression in order to find a significant and positive relationship between accessibility and learning. In other words, the more disabled students felt like their course materials were accessible, the more they reported learning in that course. Overall, there are two key takeaways from my study. First, for the very first time, we have an instrument which can be used to systematically measure disabled student perceptions of accessibility. And secondly, also for the first time, we have quantitative hard evidence that there is a positive relationship between accessibility and students' academic success. In short, it's time to take the fight for accessibility out of the courtroom and into the classroom. Thank you, Nick. Great job. Thank you. I do into to the um, couch here. Yes, there you go. <laughs> so, you know, we have a, um, a room full of educators here. I'm wondering if if you could provide us, you know, one takeaway point to improve accessibility, what should we do on our campuses? No, that's a very complicated question because accessibility is such a multifaceted um, concept. Um, the main, the main techniques that we really need to improve accessibility on a campus by campus level is first of all, more awareness. Um, I think that there's a lot of faculty, especially you know faculty who are newer to teaching or faculty who may not have taught in an online context previously before the pandemic and may not be super familiar with some of the accessibility principles that we need to make our materials accessible. And so one of the um, ways that we can promote that sort of awareness is through things like professional development, so faculty training in other words, we also need to provide a lot more resources and supports for accessibility efforts. 
So I know that we have a lot of accessibility offices on our campuses, but I mean, the task of making materials accessible is enormous. And just to give you an example, you know, if we have instructors recording videos for their students, it's really important to be able to fund things like a service where you can send videos and have them closed captioned accurately, right? Because inaccurate closed captions is, is still a huge ongoing accessibility problem. Um, so, you know, this is not, I mean, it's work that's gotten a little more attention ever since the pandemic started, but it's, it's a very intractable problem. I mean, it's not something that's going to be uh, solved tomorrow or even next year, but it's certainly work that needs to continue. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, as a new faculty member myself, I, I was completely not prepared for um, accessibility issues in my courses. So I appreciate what you're doing here because I think it's raising the awareness of what we need to do to, to do better. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I'm wondering too, what do you think the role of technology is in improving accessibility? Do you think with like, let's say the example that you put in there, the closed caption that, you know, we should be paying more attention to those technologies? So accessibility really is fundamentally about technology. It's about making technology accessible. Um, and so in my research, I found that technology can do a great deal to help us make materials more accessible, but it doesn't go 100% of the way. So just to give you an example, um, you know, just a couch at Long Beach at my institution, um, literally an hour ago, I just got an email saying that they are rolling out a program called Allied for all of our courses. And Ally is a program that takes materials like documents and converts them into accessible formats for students who might want them, you know, read through a screen reader or some other type of assistive technology. So those kind of technological tools are really, really cool. Right? And there's also tools that, you know, will create automatic captions for video. They still need to be corrected though. They're not hundred percent accurate. And that's, that tends to be a theme with a lot of these technological tools is they get us like 80 to 90 percent of the way, but we still need a human behind the wheel to get us really to the point where we're, we're being fully accessible. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much, Nick. It looks like the judges are ready to um, move on to the next presenter. So I appreciate your work. Jacob Spreister, would you please turn on your camera and microphone and say hello? Hello. Great, we can hear you. Are you ready to go? I am ready. Perfect, here we go. The year 2020 was the warmest year on record, tied with 2016. Increases in global temperatures have also increased the risk and severity of drought. And we saw this in the historical California drought of 2012 to 2016 that lasted 376 weeks. We are experiencing another drought right now with currently no end in sight. How does extreme drought like this affect local plant communities? Chaparral shrublands are widespread in Southern California and they're full of diverse evergreen shrubs, many of which are only found here. During the peak of the historic 2012 to 2016 drought, some of these plants died at high levels that were up to 90%, but others nearby appeared to be totally unaffected. You can see the difference between plants in the left image. Some are dead, but some are not. Why? Answering this question is important for understanding which species are vulnerable to future droughts. One explanation is that these plants have differences in their rooting depth. During a drought, soils dry out from lack of rain, evaporation, and plant water loss, especially in shallow soils. Plants with deeper roots could be less affected by drought because they can access deeper soils that have more water, shown in the top right figure. Conversely, shallow rooted plants, like the ones in the bottom right, may not be able to withstand the extremely dry, shallow soils. This prediction was supported by observations during that historic 2012 to 2016 drought. The plants that experienced greater mortality are thought to be shallow rooted, but we don't have a lot of data on the rooting depth of plants to verify this. It's not easy to dig up the roots of large plants to see how deep they go. In fact, it can be quite invasive to plants that are already struggling. However, we can get a little creative. We can use water chemistry to trace where plants are getting their water from. This novel method takes advantage 
advantage of the differences among elemental chemistry. Isotopes are rare forms of elements that are stable and measurable. For my research, I'm going to take soil samples ranging from the surface to very deep and extract their water. Then I will extract plant water from chaparral shrubs and match them to the soil samples using these isotopes. By doing so, I should be able to trace where these plants are getting their water from. From this data, I hope to find out the rooting patterns of shrubs and how it's related to their drought vulnerability. If successful, I can predict which plants will be the losers and winners in future droughts. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Oh, there's a timer. <laughs> um, this is really interesting. I mean, as, as you were talking and I'm, I was looking at your picture, I was thinking about how, you know, really enormous the problem of climate change is. And, and you're kind of looking at, you know, one aspect of that. Um, you know, I guess I'm wondering, once you figure out which plants will be the winners, as you put it, you know, what's the next part? What, what happens next? Do we foster that plant? Do we, what do we do to plan to help us um, mitigate any issues or more issues with climate change? That's a great question. And I think uh, first, you know, we need to tackle the problem of drought and climate change, but referring to these plant communities um, on a conservation level, uh, this research is applicable to state and federal employees who are actually out in the field managing uh, forests and parks that have these species within them. So this research is really important when they're looking at how um, their systems are going to look, you know, years from now and how it may change uh, with continued climate change and drought. So um, really this has management implications on the future of California ecosystems. Yeah, I mean, and is there any way that we can protect those that have the shallow root, those shallow roots that you were mentioning, or is it just an inevitability that those will be um, no longer there in 20 years? Yeah, that that's a really good question and something that um, needs to be tackled, right? So as far as, you know, what you can do about the drought, conserving water is a, uh, can make a big difference, um, you know, um, on your household scale, um, this can add up. Um, as far as in nature, in the ecosystems, um, that's really something that needs more research to be done. And these conservation groups and organizations are going to have to try different practices uh, to see what works. And protecting these shallow rooted species, it, it may be a big problem. And I, you know, based on my research indicates that it will be and how you do this on a large scale of, you know, millions of acres is, is a, a good question. And hopefully one um, that our, um, our government will be able to uh, manage in the future. I hope so too. I think that they just revised the average temperature of California upward one degree. Is that, I don't know if you read that recently, but I think it was in the news. Um, so it, there's evidence that, you know, this is not going away and it's getting worse very quickly. So um, yeah, I'm just wondering, how did you um, get interested in this topic? Uh, well, um, I went to CSU Bakersfield um, for my undergraduate. Um, biology um, bachelors, and I got really interested in plants, and I thought that they were really interesting, you know, how diverse they are um, from region to region, ecosystem to ecosystem, and especially those that can thrive in extreme conditions. And so um, when I was working, um, I was working and going to school, and I found that plants were the most interesting part of my job, <laughs> and uh, I I uh, had an opportunity to go into the master's program and do research on these plants that I found that I loved from work, from hiking, from camping. And so uh, it was a really good opportunity to continue my interest in plants and um, also think about the future of plants in California, you know, where I was born and raised. So um, it's it was a really good opportunity and CCB is a, I'm biased, but a, a great campus for uh, people who want to get into biology, especially plants. 
Great. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, the judges are ready to move on. So um, we're ready for the next presentation. Thank you. Julianne Bradbury, would you please turn on your camera and microphone and say hello? Hello, can you hear me? Great, we can hear you. If you're asking me if I'm ready, uh, I certainly am, but you appear to be frozen to me, Ganesh. That might be a personal problem of mine. Yeah. Oh, there you are. You moved. I think we're ready. Great. Wildfires have become more frequent, intense, and devastating in California and around the world. The image in the upper left corner of the screen may look all too familiar to you. One of the key factors that we can impact is the amount of flammable material available to burn, what scientists call the fuel load in a landscape. One of the most efficient methods of reducing the fuel load is the use of intentional fire. That's right, the proverbial fighting fire with fire. There are methods of setting fires within set boundaries to consume excess flammable plant material and lower the fuel load. Just look at the friendly flames consuming old leaf litter under an oak tree in the lower right corner of the screen. The resulting managed landscape might not burn as much or as hot when the next wildfire event threatens both wildlands and potentially adjacent human populations. This management method was implemented by native Californians for thousands of years, and it can play a key role in our response to global climate change. Scientists, land managers, landowners, they're all eager to integrate controlled burns into their work, but scientists have to be careful and consider all of the species that inhabit wildlands. Many wildlife species like deer, bears, birds, perfectly capable of getting out of the way of a well-planned controlled burn. But some valuable members of a thriving biodiverse ecosystem might be trapped by even the slowest and lowest of fires. Our native amphibians and reptiles, including the rather charming ones pictured in the bottom left and the upper right corners of the screen, won't be able to move out of the range of a multi-iker controlled burn. So the question is, will setting controlled burns harm these less mobile species? And are there ways that we could minimize or even eliminate impacts of controlled burns on these members of the ecosystem? Luckily, our lab had implemented a long-term monitoring project of amphibians and reptiles at a nature preserve in Sonoma County, California, two years before that preserve was burned in the Tubbs wildfire, the very same fire event pictured in the upper left corner. We continued collecting data following the fire so that we could analyze a before and after picture of the amphibian and lizard populations to assess how they were affected. Were there catastrophic losses? Were certain species hit harder than others? Our observations were pleasantly surprising. Most species stayed roughly the same in their numbers or, or even increased in the immediate post-fire years. We also found that these species would predictably be least affected by burns in the dry months of late summer or early fall when the Tubbs fire occurred because they're least active above ground during that time of year. These results give land managers some reassurance that controlled burns may be conducted without sacrificing these members of the ecosystem, and it provides guidance for how to best plan implementation of this practice in the interest of managing our landscape-wide fuel load to better safeguard against dangerous, damaging fire events. Thank you. Excellent timing. <laughs> Thanks, Joanne. Um, so yeah, I was I really liked this, and I I think that this is an important topic, especially in California, when we've had so many dramatic fires in the past five years. It, it's just devastating. So I'm wondering. Um, I don't know too much about land management, but I'm wondering how common is this particular mitigation um, technique? It's becoming more and more a topic of conversation. I happen to work for one of the organizations that is part of what's called the Good Fire Alliance. And so that's a Northern California organization that's both conservation organizations and then also um, private landowners uh, and scientists all coming together to um, train uh, groups of volunteers that can be a part of um, implementing fire on people's lands because it really it's a very very resource heavy project or the process right so and you and it's 
it's it's very difficult to implement in some cases because um, all of the elements have to be perfect. All of the conditions have to be perfect and they won't implement a controlled burn if it's not. So um, there's a huge input of resources that could be canceled at the last minute. So the point is uh, it takes a lot of people working together and a lot of resources to make it possible. Um, so, but that that is becoming more and more um, prevalent, and there's a, there's a lot of work going on to make it possible to implement these things, um, and that also includes like the more that we are in communication with each other on a regional basis, we can make decisions together to prioritize certain areas, right? Um, that was another thing that I was curious about with my research, is um, uh, if we found that. Um, burns were particularly um, damaging to these species, for instance, let's say you had a, you have a, a, a high risk population of western fence lizards and you know that a big fire event is going to be a problem, that means that you would prioritize adjacent areas for burns, right? So it doesn't just say don't burn this area, it says, oh, make sure you burn around it so that there's a buffer. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes into it, but um, I know that in the Midwest, it's it's already pretty well established. They have really big regional alliances. So we're, we're trying to get that started in California. Yeah, I can really see that you should, um, you know, have big banners, fight fire with fire. So yes, <laughs> yes it's not just a, a cliche. It's perfect. <laughs> I love that. Um, I think we are ready for the last student. So thank you so much, Julianne, for your work. Thank you. Okay, Conver Beer Gill, uh, would you please turn on your camera and microphone and say hello? Hello. Great, we can hear you. Are you ready to go? Yes, sir. Perfect. Here we go. Hi, everyone. My name is Conver Beer Gill, and I will be presenting my research on implicit attitudes in digital communication. So you all may be wondering, why does this matter? Well, digital communication is becoming increasingly relevant in education as more and more of our instruction begins to take place online. I mean, to prove my point, look at this competition. It's being held on Zoom, similar to most instruction in schools and universities. With that in mind, uh, imagine the following situation. You have two people in an educational setting, like a class or a breakout room, and they're exchanging ideas about a scientific concept Let's just say for this instance, climate change. The students don't tend to share anything else about themselves other than their emojis. Emojis are essentially small digital images or icons used to express an idea or emotion and they're frequently used in digital communication. With that said, we wonder if the skin tone of their emojis could affect a student's credibility with another student, perhaps maybe an instructor. In other words, could the credibility of what they say be influenced by their skin tone? But most importantly, we're interested in seeing if skin tone affects the learning experience online. With this line of research, we hope to study the implicit associations with skin tone. Previous research on skin tone suggests that people tend to hold implicit negative attitudes towards dark skin human faces as compared to light skin human faces. For example, people tend to believe humans with, say, light skin uh, may be more credible or even more trustworthy than humans with, say, darker skin. However, it's unclear whether skin tone of emojis would elicit something that is similar to human faces. With that said, we hypothesize that participants would indeed hold implicit attitudes for light skin tone emojis as compared to dark skin tone emojis. That is a preferable, preferable preference. We tested this hypothesis by using the implicit associations test, better known as the IAT. The IAT essentially measures the strength of associations between targets, so in our case, light and dark skin tone emojis and evaluations, things like good and bad, based on reaction time latencies. Essentially, participants would uh, pair up different emojis with positive and negative attributes across sets of emoji attribute combinations, and then the implicit attitudes would then be derived by their reaction times. In other words, an implicit association was seen as stronger if an individual's reaction time was faster. In our results, we were pleased to see a positive D-score, which essentially confirmed our hypothesis. In our study, a positive D-score indicated a pro-white emoji preference, essentially confirming our hypothesis. Alternatively, a negative D-score would have indicated the opposite bias, and a zero score would have indicated no bias at all. So you all must be wondering now, why does this matter? 
Well, as more and more of our education begins to take place online, it becomes increasingly important to understand the extent to which implicit attitudes affect learning or even instruction. This study provides a step into that direction by investigating skin tone bias in the context of emojis in digital communication. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Canva Beer. That was very great. That was really wonderful. Um, I think that this is, I mean, you said, why is this important? I think this is really obvious why it's important in our in this dig digital virtual world of ours that we are, we're in right now. And I'm just wondering, you know, I think that implicit bias is, is the problem. Um, obviously, a lot of times people don't realize that they have this implicit bias. You know, what would you suggest that we should do to um, make people more aware of the, of the findings of your research? Sure, I think uh, the way in which these findings can really uh, inform others is by individuals like myself pursuing this research and doing research on this topic. Uh, I believe the first thing that individuals need to do is educate themselves on this situation. Although you may not be able to alter your implicit biases, it is important to be aware of them. Being aware of them could help you understand why do you perceive other people the way you do? How do you maybe even perceive yourself? Do you think your skin tone might have an effect on how people perceive you? So I think it's extremely important work and the way in which to increase uh, the impact of this work is for individuals like myself to continue doing work in this uh, aspect of academia. Yeah, I agree. As a student, do you think that, um, you know, that this negatively affects students of color um, in the classroom? I would, in my opinion, I would say without a doubt, um, especially in terms of in the digital platform of things, uh, as you may know, for the most part, several students will keep their cameras off in things such as Zoom communication. And the images that are shown when individuals have their, image, their cameras off can really impact what an individual thinks about the other student, for instance, or even uh, what an individual thinks about, say, an instructor. So without a doubt, I would definitely say that um, that is the case, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, I, I agree as well, but I just wanted to hear your thoughts on it. Um, what is, can you remind us what your um, program is and what school you're from? Sure, yeah, I am from Cal State Chico and my program is uh, the Psychological Science Master's Program. Um, and my faculty mentors are Dr. Marie Lipman as well as Dr. Patrick Johnson. Great. Now, you're the last um, presenter here, so I'm putting something on your shoulders, but I'm just wondering, you know, this is an all graduate student panel, um, which I think is fantastic, you know, and um, I'm wondering if you could give undergraduates who are thinking about going into graduate school advice um, or try to encourage them to go into graduate school, what would you say to them? Yeah, I think it would depend on who the individual is, right? So I have several peers that were able to, that uh, just gen generally speaking, potentially had higher trajectories than myself. So what I would get at is if you are interested in going to graduate school and you're interested in going into a certain type of field, it's very important to contact those that come from a similar walk of life as yourself. And when I say that I'm tying that in with my study, I feel as though an, if an individual reached out to me with my background, the information I could give them would be very different than the information I could give someone from a different background, just because I feel as though at times uh, equity has not always been the case for everybody. And I think it's important to look up to those that come from similar paths as your own, which is why I am a student at Chico State because I, I'm from the area and yeah. Well, hopefully you'll go on to become a professor in one of the CSUs um, soon. So that will be great. And you can mentor your own students. Um, it looks like um, we are getting into the final stages of this um, competition. Um, before I turn it over to Ganesh, I just wanted to just say how inspired I am with all of you and your research. I'm sorry, of course, now I'm freezing. I'm not sure if you can hear me anymore. Um, maybe yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was terrific. Um, thank you, Elaine. Uh, this is the part where I get to say more than just ready, set, go. Um, so I hope all of you in the audience enjoyed watching the students' great presentations as much as I did. It'll take a few minutes for the judging team to verify that all scores have been entered correctly.
so that we can announce the winners of the final round. At this time, I'd like to tell you how you can vote for your favorite presentation. A Zoom poll will appear on screen for you to make your selection for the Audience Choice Award. Polling will be open for three minutes. Please look for this on your screen and be sure to vote. A first place, a second place, and audience choice winners will be selected and each comes with a fabulous prize. All three winners will receive a trophy that will be mailed to them. The first place winner will also receive a check for $1,200. The second place winner will receive $800 and the audience choice winner will receive $500. The six other participants who earned their spot in the final round will receive a plaque acknowledging their achievement that will be mailed to them as well. While we wait, please enjoy some fun facts about our CSU campuses.
Okay. The judges results and audience choice winners are in. The audience choice winner is Just give us a second. Lupe Franco. The second place winner is Nicole Roberts. And the first place winner is Julianne Bradbury. If our winners would like to activate their cameras and wave to be acknowledged, please do so now. Congratulations to our winners. Wow. Congratulations to all of our winners. Indeed, all of our presenters are winners today. In closing today's event, I want to acknowledge the large number of people across the CSU system that came together to make this event a reality. First, and most importantly, thanks and congratulations to all of our student participants. Your erudition, energy, and grace make me proud to be associated with the CSU system. Thanks also to the representatives from all the participating campuses and even some that didn't participate this year who spent months planning this grad slam. We are also very grateful to the chancellor's office for sponsoring this event. I also want to acknowledge with gratitude our distinguished judges and MCs. This event would not have been possible without your dedication and wisdom. And finally, a huge thank you to the logistics magicians who pulled everything together. This was a large team of people, but I especially want to thank Cheryl Cowan, who was really the originator of this entire idea, as well as Julia Dunn, Cliff Gold, and Christine Lugo for going above and beyond the call of duty to make this event a success. And to you, our audience, thank you all for participating and attending. What a great showcase of student research and creative activity across the CSU. We hope you have enjoyed being a part of the first ever CSU Grad Slam. We expect that this will become an annual tradition and we look forward to seeing you all at next year's Grad Slam. Thanks again, everyone. Congratulations to all of the winners and have a great day. Mm-hmm.